Villamar, and he's going to give us some exciting um, presentation and some knowledge, and then open it up with a couple other speakers, and then we'll take some Q and A. Those of you watching us on Facebook Live, I think you'll find this a fascinating session um, as a way to grow um, aquaponically and hydroponically, and not only fish, plants, and and vegetables. But um, the great thing about aquaponics and hydroponics is there's no use of pesticides, and it also uses a whole lot less uh, water than horizontal farming. And as some of you may know, about 70% of all the fresh water in the world is used by horizontal farming. And that's with a population of about, you know, 8 billion people. Most of the futurists think we're going to get to about 9 or 10 billion and kind of even out, well, think about that. that's almost a 50% growth. So where are we gonna come up with all that extra water? But at this time, I will turn it over to Carlos and he will give us a great part of his uh, presentation. First of all, uh, thank you everybody for joining. And, and uh, I wasn't quite sure how this whole thing worked, but this is being transmitted through like multiple web pages and Facebook pages. so. Don't let the small size of this particular room fool you because it's actually being transmitted, I think, to 300 different pages. Uh, anyways, my name is Carlos Villamar. I'm a veteran. Uh, I was Air Force and then I was going to be a pararescue candidate. Unfortunately, I washed out at Special Forces Scuba School and ended up becoming a civilian. I, was a, I, was, I found myself homeless in my 20s for about three months. Uh, so the veteran homeless problem is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I became an electrical engineer. I worked at a General Dynamics Hughes Aircraft and then eventually became a patent attorney. And, you know, as an engineer, I always needed a project. So I heard about aquaponics and I said, wow, the, the fish feed the plants and, you know, the, the, the fish provide nutrient water for the plants and the plants clean the water for the fish. And I'm like, I got to build one of these things. So I immediately started researching. I'm an avid researcher. So I researched aquaponics probably for about three months straight. And then I executed. And I did have sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the designs came to me. And I was also told that I need to teach everybody how to do it. So I took pictures of every single step of my process. That, that greenhouse that you see in my background, that's an actual picture of the greenhouse that I built 11 years ago from stuff that I just picked up. In other words, uh, I studied passive solar greenhouses uh, invented by the Chinese about 200 years ago. And I saw that they were growing food with four feet of snow outside. And I said, you know, my, my, my aquaponic system was outdoors. I needed a greenhouse. So I decided to build my own Chinese solar greenhouse. Uh, it's made, it's a fully insulated structure with triple, triple pane polycarb on the front. It's been operational for 11 years now. I've only had one fish kill and it was because of my own mistake. I had a grow bed that was toxic that I inadvertently let go into the pond and it wiped out my entire catfish population. I had, I had gotten my catfish to, to mate uh, in captivity, which in a 300 gallon pond supposedly doesn't happen very often, but my, my catfish had babies. So without further ado, I'm gonna cover uh, some of the, you know, I'm trying to give you the background of how I ended up in aquaponics as an electrical engineer. You know, I started, as I said, I took videos of everything. So I immediately created, uh, not immediately, but about five years later, somebody said, hey, you should have a YouTube channel. And I uploaded 400 videos or 200 videos like overnight because I had already had all the videos done. So uh, the channel is OU812 Aquaponics. Uh, and let me share my screen because you guys don't see what I'm I'm seeing. So uh, the name of the channel is OU812 Aquaponics. And the there's a playlist that's called Aquaponics Journey. And that particular journey actually covers everything in chronological order and they're all dated. So this is uh, me testing my geyser pumps and my bell siphons back in April 8th of 2013. So all the videos are dated. And this is, uh, as I said, you know, I was instructed to teach everybody what I know. And I have done that by, by basically putting every single thing, uh, you know, everything that I've done on there. 
Uh, the other thing is uh, I want to talk about the technology. So, you know, passive solar greenhouses are, you probably heard the, heard the term earth ships. Well, the, uh, the, the, the correct, you know, I always like to give credit to the original inventors. The correct way to say it is actually Chinese solar greenhouse. And that's because uh, the Chinese people invented this many years ago. And, and you've heard earth sheltered greenhouses, another term that, that, that you've heard. Well, the Chinese people would dig a hole in the side of a mountain facing the sun, and they would cover that hole with a glazing uh, or, or plastic that was at the perfect angle for the winter solstice sun. So right here, you can see my greenhouse design uh, for, this is a 47 degree angled uh, glazing, and that's for Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. My glazing is actually a lot steeper than that. But uh, can you guys see the screen okay? Or is it too small? Maybe that's better. Okay. So the, I'm going to go right into the, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time to cover this because I've been given about 15 minutes. So, but basically it's a passive solar design that has a water wall in the center, which acts as a thermal battery. On top of the thermal battery, there's an evaporative cooling system. What happens is the hot air that rises from the plant chamber gets captured by the evaporative cooling system. It pushes that cool, moist air into the mushroom chamber, which then pushes out the CO2 into the plant chamber. Uh, it's very yin and yang. There's a light side and a dark side. There's a CO2 side and an O2 side. There's a dry side and a wet side. And uh, eventually we end up designing houses and skyscrapers that use the same technology. So this was the greenhouse design, which is this uh, CO2 gas exchange design. It's passive solar, which means that it's completely insulated. And this is part of the Chinese solar greenhouse, Earthship designs, you want to have a fully insulated envelope so that that way all the solar energy gets captured by what's called a water wall, which is basically a, a wall of water painted black in the center of, of, the, of the greenhouse. And that acts as a thermal battery. As you know, it takes a long time for a pool to get hot. It takes a long time for a pool to cool. So the water wall in the middle of the greenhouse is what maintains the temperature of the greenhouse all year round with no external heating and cooling. So this is a 100% passive system uh, that you're looking at. And ag again, the credit goes to the Chinese. You know, I wanna make sure that I give credit where credit is due. So th these greenhouses uh, provide a passive solar design. There's a plant chamber, and this is on the, on this O2 side, the sun side of the greenhouse. And then there's a fish loop and the fish can, you know, you want to have the fish be able to go between the dark side and the light side, just like humans. And then, of course, we have our mushroom loop, which is on the other side of the water wall. And the water wall is what separates the light from the dark. And again, in this particular design, we have literally a bunch of fish tanks that, are, that, that have black film on them that act as a thermal battery. So right here in this picture on the left, you're looking at the thermal battery that's dividing the mushroom chamber from the plant chamber. Uh, the water wall is the thermal battery. So this is the, the thermal battery for the entire greenhouse. This is what allows the greenhouse to operate all year round without any electricity. Uh, of course, you want to add solar and wind if you want to have electronics and things like that. And if you do automated aquaponics that requires air pumps or water pumps, you would want to have some source of energy. Um, Let's see, finally, there's an evaporative cooling system on the roof of the greenhouse. And this is what captures the hot air rising from the plant chamber. As you know, when you spray water into a hot area, the water condenses and drops the temperature and increases the humidity, which is exactly what the mushrooms want. So this evaporative cooling system under the roof is what allows uh, the mushrooms to flourish uh, in their mushroom chamber over here. So this mushroom chamber at the top, it, you get the, the, the moist, uh, cool air coming in and flushing all the CO2 from the mushroom chamber back into the plant chamber. Now, I've received a patent in China, which is sort of interesting because they invented the Chinese solar greenhouse. So I feel very honored that the people that actually invented the initial technology uh, have granted my patent in China. It's been granted all over the world 
uh, multiple patents in the United States, uh, several patents overseas. Everything I do, by the way, is free for personal and educational use. Uh, I did not want to prevent people from growing their own food, uh, but I did want to have patents so that that way we can monetize them through commercial versions, like this version up here that you're looking at, uh, which is a commercially designed uh, greenhouse. This is something we would put in somebody's backyard, say in Beverly Hills or something like that. Uh, you know, we can make much cheaper versions from bamboo or, you know, the beauty of the technology, it's, it's super, super flexible. Now, the other thing about this system, uh, it's a fully composting system. So uh, let me see if I can find a decent picture. Um, well, I'll just talk about it. The, the, basically, everything in the greenhouse uh, gets reused. So what that means is that, that if you look at the actual fish pond, and it's not really well shown in this picture, actually, but um, we, we use also what's called black soldier fly and worm composting. And I can show you a quick picture of that in our art assets. And I'll just go through these real quick because I know I'm running out of time. Uh, there's the composting system and automatic fish feeder. <laughs> so I had learned that some Australians were using black soldier flies to, to uh, compost and that black shoulder, the, the larvae crawl up a 45 degree ramp, ramp to escape. So a guy in Australia had made a little composter where the where the the larvae fell into a bucket so the chickens could eat them i saw that and i said whoa what i do is this you can't see it from here but this this system has a little ramp that goes up to the fish tank <laughs> so the larvae just crawl out the, the up the ramp and into the fish tank and and it creates an auto fish feeder uh so nothing gets wasted uh the other interesting thing about the design and this is really what's novel is the fact that we've integrated mushroom production in aquaponics systems. So pictured here are actual oyster mushrooms growing as part of a flood and drain grow bed as part of an aquaponics system. What's really interesting for you biologists, uh, the, the, the mushrooms break up the, the, you know, you have your substrate, which is straw that's getting flooded and drained with fish pond water. Eventually, the mycelium takes over the straw and produces the mushrooms, and then the worms come in and produce this incredible biologically rich soil. After that, what I do is I add a layer of, of wood chips and I start growing different types of wood-loving mushrooms like uh, a wine caps. By the time I'm done with the oyster mushrooms, the wine caps, I've got a bed full of biologically rich soil that I can take out and put into my backyard. So, <clears throat> So these greenhouses could be used to green deserts because of the fact that they produce soil. The other interesting thing that you may find, Lonnie, as an aquaponics expert, is as you know, there's certain nutrients that are lacking from conventional aquaponics. In my system, the only thing I add is iron. Everything else is done by the worms and by the mushrooms, because as you know, Mushroom compost is one of the most beautiful composts on earth. Worm tea is one of the most beautiful fertilizers on earth. As our black soldier fly uh, larvae, you know, the, the excrements from the black soldier fly larvae, also an incredible, incredible natural organic fertilizer. So, you know, I've grown catfish, I've grown tilapia. I've, I've operated in, you know, like I said, 11 years now it's been running. and I'll just go through some quick slides of, of some of the inside of the greenhouse and some of the stuff that I've been doing for a long time now. Uh, and like I said, every bit of the design has been documented. And I did that because I wanted people to repeat what I did. You know, I, I wanted people to learn, like this photograph here is like when I was building my, my passive solar greenhouse, you know, you've got the, the thermoshield and you've got the triple pane polycarbonate and a bunch of PVC. I wanted to see if I could build this just from stuff that I find at Home Depot or that I could buy, but you could use bamboo. You know, the beauty of, of the technology, you know, the Chinese dig a hole in the side of a mountain. You, you know, how low tech can you get? In other words, you could make the greenhouse out of bamboo and perhaps hemp. You could use straw bale construction like they do with conventional uh, 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 Earthships, 
you know, but the main component really is the, you know, the, the concept of having a fully insulated structure where the only place that light can come in from uh, is from the, the, the light. Uh, this is when I laid out my greenhouse. There's incredible tools online that show you the, the, the sun angle so you can align your greenhouse so that it's perfectly uh, aligned with the south. Uh, and and the other interesting thing before I close is, you know, these passive solar designs, these passive solar greenhouses have not been used in large scale commercial agriculture. And I was wondering why that was the case. And I quickly realized that when I built my greenhouse and realized that half of the greenhouse was shaded. So that was the problem that I identified was that, you know, everything back here was completely shaded. So who, you know, so, so when you look at conventional greenhouses, why are they all glass? Because they want to maximize the sun everywhere. The downside is now you got to pay for heating and cooling. <laughs> These don't require heating and cooling, but half of the greenhouse is shaded. And that was the problem that I solved. I said, by combining mushroom production with fish and plant production, now you can take advantage of the fact that half of the greenhouse is shaded. Equally importantly, now we can design houses, skyscrapers, and buildings that use the exact same technology. So this is a picture of a skyscraper designed by our beautiful architects that are on the team, where now you have an atrium that is the, the plant chamber. The water wall is in the center of the building and rises multi-stories up in the air. The back of the of the water wall is where you have your everything that produces CO2, humans, fish, mushrooms. The evaporative cooling system at the top of the building is going to push all that, that beautiful oxygen that's rising from the plant chamber, moisturize it with evaporative cooling and send it down to the humans, the mushrooms, and the fish. And that all is going to get flushed back into the atrium of the building. So we've our, our beautiful architects have designed houses. You know, here's here's some of the early sketches when we were doing uh, the designs, uh, and and now we've got patents right now covering uh, all these designs. Hey, Car so, hey, Carlos, we have a go question. Go ahead. Hey, Carlos. hey, we got a question here. Another, um, how well would the system work in urban areas such as food deserts and inner city areas? Uh, we have a question from one of our guests. That's a great question. Uh, you know, we were thinking about inner city stuff, and I think our passive solar skyscrapers would have a very, very small footprint. You know, so this would be something you could, well, you know, the interesting thing about these systems, they can operate in urban or jungle areas. I designed the system to be completely off grid. You know, that's one one area, right, is you're in the middle of nowhere, there's nothing. That's when you're going to need solar panels and, and wind turbines. And you're going to be doing all sorts of composting and composting toilets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The other end of it is like, what do we put in LA, right, to solve a homeless problem? Well, we could create buildings now because, you know, because high rise buildings take the minimal footprint that would be my solution to maximizing the impact uh, in urban areas. Of course, uh, you know, here's a rendering of a, of a building, a potential building that could be designed uh, based on some of the patents that we have. And you would have a gigantic atrium. And of course, the building would incorporate the passive solar and the gas exchange design. These buildings could actually address many things because you could you can have one building that includes all the services needed to take care of the homeless, including, you know, hospital and, and healthcare and things like that. And when that's coupled with food production, now you've really got sort of a COVID proof sort of uh, building, you know, that could be used for many, many different reasons. Now, besides doing uh, buildings, we've also designed houses. Again, here's a beautiful sketch from our architect. Uh, this is the house that I want someday overlooking Lake Tahoe. Uh, this is a, a passive solar design, same exact thing. Uh, it, it's got an atrium in the front that grows your fish plants and well, your, your, your plants. In the back is where you have your humans, mushrooms, uh, and, and uh, fish. And, well, the fish go between both sides. And in the middle, you have your evaporative cooling system. 
These systems are actually very well designed for extreme environments. Think deserts and tundras. So some of the places I'm very interested in are the Antelope Valley in Southern California, Arizona, Houston, pretty much any place that's been desert desertified uh, would be a good location for these. However, I believe they also work in the tropics. I, I wanna do a tropical design and I'm looking for somebody to collaborate on building one for the tropical climates. But I think that the way I've got the system designed, it will even work in the tropics as well. And that's because the mushrooms need to be at about 90% humidity. That's all I have on the technology. And I'd be glad to answer any questions that anybody may have. Yeah, before we get into any questions, I was thinking I'd like to have David Flam share his um, what he's looking to do in Ohio on his farm, and then we'll have Chris share a little bit about Los Angeles, then we'll open it up for Q&A. Beautiful. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so my name is David Flam. My uh, background is construction. And uh, about three years ago, I started getting into the nonprofit world and uh, helping at food banks and different types of stuff. And then I um, became a board member of Global One. Uh, I love helping people out and, and, and bringing awareness to those that, that don't understand as much. And um, so what I'm bringing to the table is uh, in Ohio, we're proposed a 10 acre farm that's going to be sort of an agritourism um, with one of Carlos's uh, greenhouses uh, on property. And uh, what we're going to do is um, work with local nonprofits such as Match Pantry. I see you guys are on the line tonight to um, Give, give job training to veterans and uh, low income and, and, and uh, you know, work with the different types of people that, that's just looking for maybe even a career change. So, um, but we're, 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 we're waiting to talk to the town about a um, couple Airbnb. Um, so it'd be like an experience to come to a certified kitchen and we'd feed you uh, your whole stay. And then um, also you'd, you'd stay in the tiny homes and it would be an ecology center. So it'd show all the different ways of types of farming from the beginning to, you know, to present day and uh, what we've done wrong and, and different types of stuff that because I want to bring awareness to what we have done wrong you know we if we don't bring a awareness to those types of things we're not going to have much uh, uh solutions so um i i appreciate you all this is a great great little family that i got here and grown to known over over the time here bonnie good to see you buddy um uh, so uh, you know there's a lot more in the mix and we're, we're going globally with some uh, intentional communities or eco communities and try to um learn eco governance over uh some of the different ways we live today and, and more regenerative rather than destructive and I'm so excited with the, the, the family we've built to be able to bring these things to other people. So we'll go ahead and let Chris take it away. Thank you, David. If we could get people to mute their mics if they're not talking, I think it would be helpful. Uh, I'm in an intentional community right now, so okay. I've, got, I've got a bunch of I've got a bunch of kids behind me uh, playing games. So I, you know, I, I thought it was somebody else. I didn't realize it was coming from you. It's all right. It's all right. All right, guys. Hey, thank you, David. Um, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone, for being here and, and us being able to share some time and some information with each other and see what we can do together and bring unity to the community, giving an equal opportunity. You know, if you take the word unity out of community, you don't have one. Take the unity out of opportunity, you don't have one. 
but what it takes is you and I together's why is the acronym for unity. And we can bring that to the community. So it doesn't matter where you are, you can reach out and we can share, like he said, you know, this is for personal information. You can use what he gave you to build your own thing. Um, what we want to do is show that we have a, a sustainable way to recover and rebuild natural disasters and never use another tree. And at the same time, we can build buildings that will grow trees. And we can show our children that they are the solution to every adult's problem. I'm the founder of an organization called Hope. I'm going to give you a double dose of hope. The second one is the name. Humans on planet Earth. That's you and me. Where that's hope. Now, housing our people everywhere is you and me also. So working together in the community, we can create unity. And we can give our children food every day when they get out of school. We can engage with them. That would give, We can call that program Fuel for the Future because then they're going to design the cities of the future. And when those kids from kindergarten to eighth grade push enter, an adult goes to work. But it changes lives. I built a, a tiny house with a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old. They, they lived out in the country and they don't have a problem with homelessness around them. But they come to another city and in two and a half hours, they built all that material. So we want to use the washers, dryers, refrigerators, stoves, water heaters, and cars and build homes listen, that won't you can get the other one and plug in. That won't burn, won't absorb water. They're stronger, termite-free, mold-resistant, seismic, recyclable. Build them without a dumpster. Build them cheaper than wood, and get a sixty percent discount on insurance versus a wooden home. In two thousand six, I built a home where the eye of the storm came across for Hurricane Katrina. That house saves eleven thousand dollars a year in insurance versus the wooden one next door to it that's made out of wood. It's a thousand square foot smaller. Now, in 2011, I built a home out of recycled cars from Hurricane Katrina in the middle of the woods with cordless screw guns to prove we could do it in any jungle on the planet. And with five people that never touched the material before in their life, is an 1800 square foot house, nine foot ceilings. The highest electric bill has been $45, highest gas bill has been $25. And it melts the snow off the driveway and sidewalk. The attic is the same temperature as the house, and so is the garage at no cost to the resident, and it has no solar and no geothermal on it. The, the house was deemed the best built home in the city by every building inspector, and it was built with no dumpster. It's the first time a house was built in Illinois without a dumpster. And I think the only time. So the, the point behind all this is, is we can use the stuff that we recycle and it'll last a thousand years, give our children a legacy to live on forever and offer a solution. I have machines that there's a factory in Arizona that makes 6,400 linear feet of material an hour. Now this is all building material. It's cut to length. All you do is put the erector set together and I've put out a challenge to do 50 cities in 50 weeks. We've got 24 cities set up, but it doesn't matter. I'll come back to a city because sometimes the city can't see it all at once. But it is time that you take the challenge. We bring the, the house and we build it with the community in just a few hours. But we change someone's life forever. And if you can't come out and, and spend an hour, maybe you can just share what we are doing. Hopeforhousing.org is the website, and I look forward to engaging with all of you. We are implementing a solution to Los Angeles as they put out a state of emergency on the homelessness problem, and we are going to be implementing a project to bring our stat houses. Those are superior to a tent, and we have a stat two, and that is superior to a trailer. The stat house has a bathroom, but it doesn't have a kitchen. The stat two does have a kitchen and it's fully functional living situation. 
We have partners that are building five, eight foot by 20 foot homes every day on trailers. So you can put in an order. Uh, they are live, ready to move into every day. They have butcher block countertops and they're beautiful. They're, we, we can design any blueprint that's ever, or we can build any blueprint that's ever been designed and anyone that ever will be. And I want everybody to know that you are a creator every second of the day, but what are you creating? And what our children can create because their imaginations is, is unlimited. And the thing is, is if, if it's factual, then let's make it happen. Let's show them that they matter. Let's, let's put, let's let them put a footprint here that shows why they were here. All of us have a purpose and people need to know they're not helpless, hopeless and alone. There is a solution and we can do it all together. And I thank you for having this platform and allowing me to speak. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. So let's open it up for any questions, Q&A session, um, and then anybody on, can ask any questions. Um, you can either raise your hand in the Zoom room or put it, your question in the chat, or if you just want to mute yourself and um, ask your question, or if you have a comment. Yeah, I would, I would like to, uh, did I unmute myself? Can you hear me? Yes, sure can. Okay, thank you. Uh, for, for both of you that just spoke about your, your, the housing and also the, the greenhouses that you've designed, uh, I'm so proud of both of you for the work and effort and, and heart you put into this. God bless you both. Uh, but I'm also a seeker of knowledge and, uh, and ways to help others. Um, I, I love the, the passive greenhouse effect. We were going to do all ours underground and basically use solar tubes to bring the light in, but this gave me a new idea. Um, I would also like to be in the, in the realm of this for teaching others, and that's what we were going to do in Tennessee, is use the platform that we were building down there, not only to lift people up spiritually, but also give them an opportunity to take this back to their communities. And I would so be interested in, in using the, the work and the effort and the blessings that you've both been given by God to bring this to, to the earth and, and show people how we need to do these things, because we all know that there's going to be a lot of continents that can't even produce food anymore with what's happening in the environment. So you're, you're on the edge of it right now, and I'm glad that you've got it developed. I would be so much interested in, in Carlos maybe trying to figure out how we could take one of your greenhouses in the area we're in and produce the food for our veterans, but also use it as a teaching tool for the world. Uh, we plan on doing that same concept you're at when we're in Tennessee with our village. Um, so we, we, I would love to have more time with you and spend some time to sit down and kind of give you a little bit more about what MASH does and how many people we serve and how that, what you've done already would serve so many more people um, because that's what we're in the mission of doing is serving as many as we can. And I found my purpose in life to be a very simple one to live. And this is my purpose is to love as many as I can, the best I can till I take my last breath. And I just think I love what you guys are doing. And I want that to be part of MASH also and helping other people and also being used as a teaching tool. So I would love to be able to sit down with both of you at some point in time. Uh, Elaine's involved with another lady that lost her son in the service. And one of her big things is to provide housing for the homeless veterans and the transitional veterans that are coming out of service that doesn't have a place to put their head on a pillow where it's comfortable and be able to go in and take a shower. So we want to create housing also for our veterans. Uh, this is a new project for us. We've been in discussion with it for probably five, six months now, but uh, it's a discussion now. But uh, maybe with your help and your expertise, you can help lead us down the path and shed some light on that path so that we can serve even more people with that. You know, I, I just want to say right now, you know, with, with Chris's machines that crank out steel, you know, this is the problem that I had. I had the idea. I had the greenhouse in my backyard, but I didn't have production. And then on Clubhouse, somebody said, you got to talk to this guy named Chris Collins. You got to talk to this guy, Chris Collins. I, I talked to Chris and it was literally like one of these aha moments. It's like, you got peanut butter and my chocolate. I got chocolate. He goes, I got machines that can produce steel that crank out frames. And I'm like, and I need somebody that can make frames for my design. 
he was building tiny homes to feed the homeless. I want to build tiny homes and greenhouses to feed and house the homeless. So it literally was, you know, I don't want to say it was a coincidence. It was destiny. destiny. And, and and since then, we've got an incredible team. We've got Peter with, with the One Global Network. We've got David with Community Grid. We've got ASU students involved. You know, this has been my passion now for 11 years is how long I've been working at this. And I've been like chicken little, you know, hey, guys, you know, you got to grow your own food. And, 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 you know, nobody was listening. And now we need to do it. You know, we needed to do it 10 years ago, actually. Exactly. Right, right. But, but now we got to move a lot quicker. The beauty of these greenhouses is once you build it, it's fully sustainable. Nothing gets wasted. Once you grow your first fish, you got fish babies. Once you grow your first plant, you got seeds. Once you grow your first mushroom, you got mushrooms. Right. And then the greenhouse produces soil, organic food. And get this, if you put it over salt water, it generates drinking water. Because the front of the greenhouse is a solar still. Many military guys know what a solar still is, right? Yeah. You dig a hole. Put a, well, the whole front of the greenhouse is a solar still which means if you put these on barges on the ocean or if you created channels, like for example, let's take a look at the Gulf of Mexico. How do we clean up the Gulf of Mexico? You've got the Mississippi River dumping all the nutrients from the heartland into the Gulf of Mexico, killing everything in the Gulf of Mexico. We could take an array of these greenhouses and houses and buildings, because it doesn't matter. It could be greenhouses, houses, and skyscrapers. You put them in an array right around the Gulf, and you channel the salt water first through some, you know, through perm using permaculture, through some banana trees and some bamboo, some bevetier grass. And then that final water gets to the greenhouses that now extract clean drinking water from that and now creates aquaponic systems. You could do this in the deserts. We could go to the Sahara Desert along the ocean, put a, an array of these buildings and, and greenhouses. By the way, since they're passive solar, they produce more energy than they consume, which means let's talk about Lancaster, California, on Mexican military. I, I lived in near Palmdale. You guys may know the Antelope Valley for you guys in California. You know, everybody used swamp coolers there, and there's tons of desert land waiting to be bought because nobody knows what to do with it. Yeah. So there's like huge commercial lots sitting in Lancaster, California right now, pennies on the dollar. And nobody knows what to do with them. I know what to do with them. We start building these villages that have, you know, eco villages. And by the way, all technologies, I'm not talking just the way I did it. You know, we need everybody's brain together on everything, everything. Yeah. And now we start building those villages in Lancaster, California. I want to start with vets and I'll tell you why. We're looking for a mission. We vets are you know, we we joined the military because we wanted a mission. You know, you know, we live for serving. You know, in in the military, as you know, there's no color. You know, we all bleed yeah. red. And and the reason I'm very very interested in the veteran community, besides being a homeless vet myself for a little while, is that they need a mission and they get it. And once you, you once you put them on task, they'll they'll move mountains. Yeah. And, and I would like to start an eco village in Lancaster, California. I'm saying it here right now. I want to start an eco village in Lancaster, California on some commercial property where we sell the electricity back to the county and where our veterans are living, growing their own fish, growing their, their own plants, growing their own mushrooms, and then providing the local communities with food and feeding the homeless and solving all those problems. As you can I'm, tell, I'm a little bit passionate about this, but it's something that, you know, I've been working on well a decade now. And, and I'm so happy to meet everybody in this room. David, Lonnie, John, I haven't gotten here from a lot of people here. You know, Brother Chris, who is a godsend, but everybody's a godsend, right? right. We're all here on the same mission. You know, right. we're all on the same mission. And the other thing that I want to talk about is open collaboration, you know, we have to get away from this mindset that I'm going to do it myself because I want the notoriety and I want to be, you know, screw that. We're if, And that's the beauty of the military. There is no army of one. OK, that was the biggest commercial scam I've ever heard in my life. I said army of one. 
that you can't operate alone, okay? Everything is about teamwork. Everything is about relying, loving your team more than yourself. If we start taking that approach to what we're doing, we will solve every problem on earth within a year. Imagine every single human collaborating on the same problem at once and, and using all the technology we have right now to solve it. We could solve every single problem on earth and I'm gonna get off the podium because I can talk forever. <laughs> hey, yep, uh, Elaine accuses me that all the time because I've, I've, written, I've written a book and so I'm a storyteller. So sometimes she's got to go, stop, stop, stop. So I'm with you. <laughs> just just poke, poke them in the ribs a couple of times. Any oh, she already questions? has tonight. She already oh, yeah. has tonight. <laughs> get, get them, Elaine. Get them. <laughs> you know, my wife is not here, right? My wife isn't here because she's like, if you talk about aquaponics one more freaking time, I'm going <laughs> to refuse to, you know, like, and when we go anywhere, she's like, you're not going to talk about aquaponics, right? And I'm like, I can't promise that. Yeah. And, <laughs> any other questions? And I have one, one of our guests, Dawn, she's with the Center for Economic and Social Justice. And she's going to be, they're going to be giving an awesome presentation Sunday at 2 p.m. on the same Zoom. Dawn, if you have a couple questions or comment, but then tell us about your session. Give us the one minute elevator speech because I think it's some real great potential working with the uh, with the team we're talking about in some of the cities. Well, hello everyone. I was kind of lurking in the background here, but it was this was such an exciting presentation and session and it, it raises the question of how do you um, I guess commercialize or expand and multiply these ideas and that takes money. And uh, the session we're going to be giving on Sunday really looks at um, the money system and how it can either help to dominate a lot of people or help to liberate every person. And it really, it relates to how each of us can uh, become uh, economically self-sufficient through our ownership of the things, the tools we use to create goods and services. So as I was listening to this, uh, this session, what I heard was just remarkable uh, technological solutions to the problems that are facing the world. And um, we're working, for example, with uh, people in St. Louis who are living in really some of the most uh, poverty stricken and crime-ridden areas, and they're looking for solutions that will empower not a few, uh, not just outsiders, but every person. And the really the key to doing that is we have to understand um, how we bring these new ideas into being. And it, it does, it takes money, but money should not be a barrier. It need not be a barrier or an obstacle if we know um, how it should be used and how it should be created. So the discussion will be, uh, we'll have three speakers, um, uh, one of whom uh, were, was the president of the Bridgeport NAACP for 14 years. And the other is our strategic partner, Gene Gordon in St. Louis. And um, there've been a lot of interesting developments that have started on the state level um, in terms of legislation and, um, and as well as federal law. Uh, but now we're looking for partners who can bring in their expertise in, in various uh, fields, including what, what we're, you're discussing here today. So just thank you so much for that. And um, we invite everyone to join us on uh, Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern, and uh, I guess through uh, Peter's, uh, his Zoom uh, channel. Yes, thank you so much, Dawn. Uh, any other questions or comments from um, any of the panelists? Yes, I would like to step in for a few seconds. Chris and Carlos, wonderful ideas. There are so many good things that, that can come out of what you're doing. Um, I'll be working with Lonnie soon, and hopefully we'll all be working together to pull all these kind of things off. Thank you, Warren. And Tell a little bit about your organization. You're one of our partners with Global One. You also 
been a board member of Global One, so we all work together with Shimro. Uh, 